Welcome to this installment of Clarifying Tax Situations with attorney and CPA, David W. Clossing. Hi, thanks for joining us. Today's video is on inbound taxation. What do foreigners need to know before they attempt to do business in the United States about United States taxation? Before a foreign individual or a foreign entity or a foreign corporation decides to do business in the United States, this video is going to discuss what are the basic things you need to know before you attempt this from a tax perspective. Failure on your part to have this type of conversation or think about these issues before attempting to do business in the United States could cost you significant amounts of tax penalties and interest. Furthermore, foreign entities that don't comply with the foreign information reporting regime or all the regulations surrounding transfer pricing and the disclosure surrounding transfer pricing can incur substantial penalties if you don't know what you need to know before you start doing business in the United States. The tax law offices of David W. Clossing, myself and my staff, can help you know what you need to know before you step on a landmine. You really want to talk with us before you approach the U.S. market. The goal here is to reduce the toxic effects of double taxation, taxation in your home market and taxation in the U.S. markets. You're going to be taxed twice. The idea is to minimize the effects of that double taxation. All the while, we have to do this minimization within the bounds of U.S. tax law. One major consideration if you're a retailer in approaching the U.S. market are the transfer pricing regulations and the penalties that can be incurred if you don't comply with them properly. Transfer pricing regulations set forth how a related entity may set internal prices when transferring goods, services, loans, and intangible assets. These regulations apply in domestic and international contexts. The general goal of the transfer pricing regulations is to equate a controlled transaction with a non-controlled transaction. Non-controlled is where goods and services are sold to a third party in an arm length transaction. A controlled transaction is where you're selling from one entity to a related entity. Oftentimes this is done to try and control in which market the majority of the gain or loss is recognized on a transaction. Consider this example. You're going to sell a widget for $10. Okay, if you sell it from organization A to organization B for $8, and then ultimately from organization B to an end user for $10, that's a $2 gain on that transaction recognized in the U.S. market. How about if you sold it for $6 between organization A and organization B. Well, when organization B sells it in U.S. markets for $6, that's a $4 gain. You can see that by controlling transfer pricing, you can pick which market recognizes the majority of the gain. Of course, you want to recognize the majority of the gain in the jurisdiction that has the lower tax burden. Transfer pricing regulations try and stop this perceived abuse. Again, the arm's length regulations are considered comply with when a controlled transaction between related entities is on par with a non-controlled transaction between arm's length parties, as in an open market transaction. One method to avoid potential penalties and interest surrounding the transfer pricing regulations is to engage in an advanced pricing agreement with the U.S. government before you enter the U.S. market as to transfer pricing. What are the basics of U.S. international taxation? International taxation can be best conceptualized as the application of the U.S. tax system in an international environment. U.S. taxation in the international context extends to two generalized transaction classes, inbound taxation and outbound taxation. Outbound taxation can be described as Investments of U.S. persons and entities in offshore activity, outbound. Inbound taxation has to do with investments in the U.S. by foreign persons or offshore entities coming to do business in the United States, inbound taxation. Okay, it helps to just get some general concept out of the way when we start discussing inbound taxation. First of all, it helps to understand that the United States is one of the few governments in the world that taxes its citizens on their worldwide income. 
In other words, if you're a citizen of the United States or you're considered a tax resident, you're taxed on your worldwide income. That means if you make income offshore, it's taxable. If you make income onshore, it's taxable. Income anywhere in the world is taxable if you're considered a U.S. citizen or resident, tax resident. In contrast, individuals who are neither citizens of the United States nor tax residents of the United States are only taxed to a limited extent as far as U.S. federal taxation goes. Said another way, inbound taxation involves the U.S. government looking to tax foreigners or foreign entities where they find significant nexus with the United States for tax purposes. Nexus means sufficient contacts with the United States to justify the U.S. asserting tax on certain transactions. We'll get into that specifics in a minute. The concept of nexus is where the U.S. is looking for sufficient or substantial enough connection with the United States to justify the U.S. stepping in and taxing a transaction. Generally, there's two types of jurisdiction the U.S. government can assert. There's in rem jurisdiction, which is jurisdiction of property, in personam jurisdiction, which is jurisdiction over the person. A person in this context can be an individual or an entity. An example of in rem jurisdiction is where a foreign person or a foreign entity sells U.S. real estate, real estate located within the United States. The U.S. government has in rem jurisdiction over all U.S. real estate. Therefore, if a foreign person or a foreign entity sells U.S. real estate, that's sufficient nexus in rem jurisdiction to assert a tax over that transaction. Whether or not a non-resident alien or a foreign entity has filing requirements, and that the requirement to file tax returns in the United States depends on the nature of their conduct with or regarding the United States. Generally, if a non-resident alien or a foreign entity is running a U.S.-based trader business, they must file a tax return even where there's no effectively a connected income related to that U.S. trader business. I'll explain what effectively connected income is in a second. This filing requirement exists even where there was no U.S. source income or where the U.S. source income was exempt from tax. A tax return is even required where a foreign person or entity is taking a position, a treaty-based position, which overrides domestic law, and because of that treaty position, no income tax is due. Where a foreign individual or a foreign entity is filing a U.S.-based tax return, and the tax position has changed because of the treaty-based position, in addition to the tax return filing requirement, a treaty-based position statement must be attached to that filing. In addition to having to file a tax return in the United States, there are certain situations where a foreign individual or foreign entity may want to file a tax return in the United States. Take, for example, where the foreigner desires to claim a refund for overwithheld or overpaid tax or claim the benefit of any deductions or credits that may apply. Take, for example, where U.S. tax may have been overpaid and the foreigner might want to file a return to claim a refund, get the benefit of some deductions, or claim any potential credits by filing a tax return. However, if a non-resident alien is deemed not to be engaged in U.S. trader business, but still has taxable income within the United States, uh, considered FEDAP, fixed, determinable, and periodic, there may not be a need to file a tax return in the United States if the statutory withholding is sufficient to cover the tax generated by that FEDAP income. So, what activity of foreign individuals or foreign entities is sufficient to create U.S. nexus to tax? Nexus for the U.S. government to tax a foreign individual or foreign business can be created in several manners. The first is presence. Presence within the United States can be sufficient alone to create tax nexus. An individual's continuing or repeated physical presence in the United States can create nexus through the classification of the individual as a tax resident. 
citizen or resident alien. This creates worldwide nexus or a non-resident alien limited U.S. nexus for income tax purposes. This is very important. If you get nothing else out of this video, remember this. If you're a non-resident alien and you spend 183 consecutive days in the United States, that is enough for you to be classified as a resident alien for U.S. tax purposes and you become taxed on your worldwide income. So if you had lots of income generating assets in your home country, if you were running a business in your home country, if you have retirement funds coming from your home country, you can find all of those funds being subjected to worldwide taxation by the United States. Not just the income you generate in the United States, but the income you're generating anywhere in the world becomes taxable if you meet the substantial presence test. Very important. Presence in the United States for at least 183 days is generally sufficient to create U.S. nexus over certain activities of non-resident alien. Foreign individuals or foreign entities are generally taxed in two major ways on their U.S. income. Where a foreign individual is deemed to be carrying on a U.S. trade or business and they have effectively connected income to be defined in a minute, they are generally taxed in the same manner as a U.S. taxpayer based on net income, not gross, net, which is uh, net is defined as gross income minus all applicable expenses, effectively connected expenses, to come up with a net number, and that is subjected to the same graduated tax brackets as a U.S. taxpayer. Where we're discussing a foreign entity, a foreign corporation for that matter, that's running a branch within the United States. Okay, you got a foreign corporation running a U.S. branch. That U.S. branch, if it's engaged in a U.S. trader business, and has effectively connected income will be taxed at net graduated tax brackets the same as a U.S. entity would be. The only difference is where you've got a foreign corporation that's running a branch, that branch may be subjected to the branch profits tax in addition to the income tax at the entity level. I'll discuss what the branch profits tax is a little bit later. Where a non-resident individual or a foreign entity is generating income in the United States that is deemed not to be from a trader business and not effectively connected with the U.S. trader business, that income is taxed at a flat 30% rate on the gross income. All related expenses are ignored. Generally, this type of income is considered FEDAP, fixed, determinal, and periodic. It's taxed at a flat 30% rate on gross income. All expenses are ignored. And this 30% rate can be modified by treaty. A third way in which a non-resident alien or non-resident entity could be taxed, certain classes of fixed, determinal, and periodic income are excluded from taxation by the Internal Revenue Code specifically to foreign taxpayers and foreign entities for policy reasons. For example, interest income. Certain types of interest income are excluded from U.S. taxation with the idea that if funds are loaned in the United States, that's good for the U.S. economy. To not tax a foreigner lending into the United States is expected to generate more loans in the United States, which is supposed to increase the economy. So for policy reasons, certain types of interest income are not taxed in the United States by a foreigner. Individuals who are not deemed by law to be citizens of the United States can be classified as non-resident aliens in the following two manners. Under the green card test or under the substantial presence test. Under the green card test, an alien that is lawfully admitted to the United States becomes subject to worldwide taxation upon being granted a green card and upon their first day of physical presence within the United States. From that day forward, their worldwide income is subjected to U.S. taxation. Once this status is granted, green card status, resident alien status, this status continues irregardless of the actual amount of time spent in the United States until the green card is either surrendered or revoked. Permanent resident status in the United States can be revoked by the immigration authorities. Example, if you commit a felony while you're a permanent resident, 
your status will be revoked. You have no right to live in the United States at that point. Or where it's determined by a court of law that you've abandoned your green card. Or where a green card holder voluntarily turns back in their green card. Those are the ways you can lose permanent resident status in the United States. The substantial presence test can be met in two manners. The first is the individual is physically present in the United States, by the way, partial days count, on a minimum of 31 days, which need not be consecutive during the year that is being tested for income tax purposes. Second, the alien has spent at least 183 days, again, partial days count, in the United States during the testing period, which is the year we're counting, and the two preceding calendar years based on the following calculation. Okay, the first part of the calculation is the number of days spent in the United States during the testing year, which is normally the year we're looking at. Uh, remember, partial days count in this calculation. The best way to get at this information is to get out your passport and look at the days you arrived and the days you left. So for example, if the testing year were 2015, we would look at all the days spent in the United States in 2015 by looking at the days you entered the United States and the days you left the United States, partial days count, and we would add those up. Then we would look at what happened in 2014 and 2013 to see if we get to that magic 183 day number. But in the testing year 2015, we need at least 31 days before we even need to test the prior two years. So in my example of looking at the 2015 tax year, in 2014 we would also look for all days spent in the United States by looking at when you got here and when you left based on your passport, but we would only count those days by one third. So add up the number of days in 2014 for example and take one third of those days for that portion of the calculation. Then we'd look at 2013. We'd look at the number of days spent in the United States and we would only take one-sixth of the days in 2013 in this example. We would round up to the nearest whole day in 2013 and 2014, add up the days from 2013, the days from 2014, the days from 2015. If that came up to greater than 183 days, you're considered to have met the substantial presence test and therefore will be treated as a tax resident and taxed on your worldwide income. If you're a dual national, holding a green card or being a citizen of the United States and a citizen of another country, you need to realize that you're subjected to worldwide taxation as a U.S. tax resident irregardless of that dual status. Dual nationals are subject to U.S. worldwide taxation even if they're wholly unaware that they're U.S. citizens. It's important to note that U.S.-based corporations, partnerships, and LLCs, in other words, they're formed underneath the laws of the United States, are subjected to taxation on their worldwide income just like a U.S. tax resident would be, even where owned by foreign individuals. Foreign entities, on the other hand, entities created outside the United States are only subjected to limited taxation in the United States and this is generally true no matter where that entity is managed from. Now we're going to discuss U.S. activities of foreign corporations that could create U.S. tax nexus. So as a starting point, where a foreign corporation has solely foreign ownership and solely foreign source income, no U.S.-based trade or business, no U.S. deemed effectively connected income, U.S. government does not have nexus to tax the activity of that foreign corporation. So, what creates nexus of the U.S. government to tax a foreign corporation? Either ownership by U.S. citizens or U.S. source income. It's important to note here that the very characteristics of a foreign corporation create the potential for a permanent deferral of income for U.S. tax nexus purposes. A foreign corporation never has income that's subjected to U.S. taxation if it's solely foreign source income and foreign ownership. Therefore, foreign corporations are on the target list for abuse if it turns out they're actually owned by U.S. citizens. 
But it's important to note here that foreign individuals or foreign entities, even with no physical presence in the United States, can face U.S. tax nexus if they have source income coming from the United States. The income source rule under U.S. law vary by type of income under consideration. As we said earlier, the business income deemed to be U.S. trader business or effectively connected with the U.S. trader business is taxed on a net basis at graduated tax brackets by a foreign individual or a foreign entity. The key here surrounds a couple concepts. First is what exactly will be deemed a U.S. trader business? I can tell you that in the international perspective, what is actually deemed to be U.S. trader business under the law, the case rulings, the regulations is a bit vague, but we'll get into it in a minute. So again, a couple concepts. Net taxation rather than gross taxation. Have to find a U.S. trader business and it has the income in question has to be effectively connected with it. Well, also, if we're going to go net, we have to talk about deductions. The only deductions that will be allowed when a foreigner is deemed to have a U.S. trader business are the effectively connected deductions to the U.S. trader business. The same distinctions are made under U.S. law as to trader business deductions or personal deductions when looking at a foreign taxpayer as would be applied to a U.S. taxpayer. Foreigners are also required to distinguish between capitalizable expenses, expenses that need to be placed onto the balance sheet and then recaptured through amortization or depreciation, or current expenses, where a current expense can be deducted through the current year's profit and loss, reducing the income from gross to net. To this end, depreciation and amortization deductions are just as available to a foreign taxpayer as they are a U.S. taxpayer. The controlling element in establishing a U.S. trader business is the level of activity conducted by a foreign individual or a foreign entity within the United States. On one end of the spectrum, we have passive investment-like activity. Example, you would buy one asset in the United States and you just wait for that to appreciate. On the other end of the spectrum is the active conduct of trader business in the United States, which we'll get into. All that's required is a squishy concept of sufficient activity aimed at generating a profit within the United States to establish a trader business. In addition, having certainty as to whether you're carrying on a trader business is complicated by the fact that actions of employees and agents can be imputed to a foreign individual or a foreign entity to establish a U.S. trader business. Quite often, the difficult question is not whether you have enough activity to establish a U.S. trader business. It's where this activity is being carried out. Is it U.S. activity or non-U.S. activity? To complicate things even further, certain types of activity, even where substantial within the United States, will not give rise to a U.S. trader business solely because of that activity. For example, Generally speaking, solely promotional activity within the United States is not enough to give rise to U.S. trader business, even where this promotional activity is substantial. Again, promotional activities such as advertising, gathering and dispensing information, or displaying merchandise in a showroom. Solely promotional activities will not give rise to U.S. trader business in and amongst itself. However, adding some sort of sales activity in the United States, soliciting orders, for example, will give rise to U.S. trader business. Another example, the mere purchasing of merchandise within the United States for sale solely offshore will not in and of itself establish U.S. trader business. However, if you add to this that any type of production or manufacturing of those goods to be sold offshore and you have created a U.S. trader business. The mere solicitation of orders via mail order or by the internet by an offshore seller that is selling goods from offshore into the United States is insufficient to establish U.S. trader business irregardless of where title to those goods passes from the seller to the buyer, whether that happens offshore or onshore. However, you add even the slightest amount of sales office presence in the United States or warehousing in the United States and now you have a U.S. trader business. Danger, 
the imputation of trader business because of the actions of third parties can cause you to have a U.S. trader business when you don't expect to have one. The direct participation of an offshore individual or offshore entity is not required for the finding of a U.S. trader business, provided there's sufficient agency of U.S. persons. A broad range of activities conducted by third parties can impute U.S. trader business activity to an offshore person. Keep in mind for corporations that are considered separate legal beings from their owners, the actions or third parties are necessary to carry out any type of business. The most common cases of imputations of third parties are when agents are used in the United States or employees are used in the United States. Under U.S. law, actions taken through employees or agents can be seen as actions of the offshore taxpayer directly. The nature of the agency relationship, which turns on the amount of control over the agent that the principal has, determines whether the imputation takes place. In the United States, the common law employment relationship imparts a high degree of control under the law from the master over the actions of the servant. One limiting factor is where the W-2 employee is acting within the scope of their employment. Actions outside the scope of their employment possibly will not be imputed from the servant to the master. Agency relationships that impart by law a lesser degree of control, for example, independent brokers, may not necessarily impart the actions of the third party to the offshore foreign person or entity. So again, we keep looking at this continuum of activity. On one hand, on this end of the spectrum is passive investment-like activity, and on the other end of the spectrum is active trader business-like activity. Case law in this area shows that in order to carry on a trader business, the offshore person or entity's actions need to be considerable in the United States, continuous in the United States, and regular within the United States. A good example of this is a single sale of merchandise in the United States, even through an agent, will ordinarily not rise to the level of traded business. But continual, regular, and considerable sales of inventory in the United States, even where conducted through an agent, will give rise to a trader business. Case law also shows that where a foreign taxpayer or entity comes in the United States and is present in the United States, to show off their product and solicit orders that is sufficient to establish a U.S. trader business. Under Code Section 864B, where a foreign individual is present in the United States to render personal services, whether this is done as an independent contractor or as an employee, this is considered a U.S. trader business. Under Code Section 875, where trader business activity is found to be carried on by a partnership, an estate, or a trust, this trader business activity will be imputed to any partner in that partnership, whether they're foreign or domestic, or to any beneficiary in that estate or trust, whether they're foreign or domestic. Consequently, where a partnership, a trust, or an estate is found to be carrying on U.S. trader business with effectively connected income, that effectively connected income will flow through to any foreign partner or any foreign beneficiary in the trust or the estate. The investment in real property or the development of real property or the rental of real property can rise to a trader business or it can be considered investment activity. The same distinctions are made between foreign investors and domestic investors in this area. For example, coming into the United States and buying a piece of raw land, speculating that it's going to rise in value over time, is not considered active business activity, that is passive investment activity. On the other hand, where sufficient investments are made in U.S. real estate, especially rental real estate, whether that be commercial or residential real estate, if you have a sufficient amount of it, it can rise from investment activity up to trader business activity. Sales of merchandise are often the final step in earning a profit in a U.S. base or international trader business. These activities are often preceded by manufacturing, distribution, marketing activities. 
US-based manufacturing or any type of active production is usually sufficient, even in minute levels of activity, to establish US trader business. Any property that is sold following some sort of production activity becomes very clear that a US trader business is being conducted if that manufacturing or production takes place in the United States. At the other end of that spectrum, the occasional investment in US-based assets followed by occasional sales may not in and of itself rise to the level of a trader business. In the United States, we have two classifications of income. Ordinary income, which is coming from active trader business, and capital income, which is coming from passive investment-like activity. Ordinarily, capital gain rates are lower than ordinary income tax brackets in the United States. Occasional sales and investment type assets produce capital gains and losses for passive commitments of capital. Another defining characteristic of trader business besides the level of activity is any element of value added created in that activity. Like sales of real estate in the United States, the lending of money in the United States can range all the way from passive activity, one loan to a relative, to active activity, running a bank. The classifying as money lending as a trader business activity requires the following. Known borrowers and lending with a sufficient degree of regularity and a sufficient volume. Securities trading within the United States can range from passive activity buying one security, speculating it's going to increase in value before you sell it, to active activity, coming into the United States, setting up an office with 10 employees designed to identify good investment activity and actively trading on a daily basis to try and recognize capital gains. That would be investment activity sufficient to be found in U.S. trader business in the right circumstances. Again, the agency rules can come into effect here. If you have an agent in the United States charged with buying and selling these securities, an employee, an independent contractor, that activity can be imputed to you if it's sufficient enough to rise to a trader business. It also helps to have a U.S.-based office if you're trying to establish a U.S. trader business in the investment area. Conversely, with the absence of a U.S. office or the absence of an employee or a sufficient agency relationship, ordinarily investment activity will not rise to the level of trader business in securities. Additionally, if the foreign investor is trading for their own account, this can escape U.S. taxation even where they're utilizing a U.S. agent or they have a U.S. office in certain circumstances. So now let's define effectively connected income. If a taxpayer is found to be engaged in U.S. trader business, generally any of the following activity will be considered effectively connected income with that U.S. trader business. All sales, service, or manufacturing income will be found to be effectively connected if it's U.S. based. It's important to note that a foreign corporation whose sole contact with the United States is a branch in the United States has effectively connected income where the business is conducted in the United States through that branch. Ordinarily, if title to goods passes in the United States, that is deemed to be effectively connected income with the U.S. trader business. It's important to note that once a U.S. trader business is found, not only can U.S. activity be found to be effectively connected with that U.S. trader business, but foreign effectively connected income can be found to be related to a U.S. trader business. Although not generally taxable in the United States, foreign source income can by exception be taxed in the United States if it's related to a fixed place of business in the United States or a U.S. office of a foreign business. For example, where a foreign business is running a U.S. trader business and they arrange for an offshore sale of goods but they know that the intention of the buyer is to utilize those goods in the United States, that will be considered effectively connected income to a U.S. trader business, not foreign source income, non-taxable. If a foreign office of a foreign corporation is involved in the sale of a good, 
and the buyer of that good intends to use that good solely outside the United States, ordinarily this will not lead to effectively connected income with the U.S. trader business. In most cases, a foreign taxpayer is deemed to have an office or fixed place of business in the United States if it has a store, plant, or place where business is conducted in the United States. An office or fixed place of business of an agent does not alone satisfy the requirement for effectively connected income unless the agent possesses and regularly exercises the authority to negotiate and conclude contracts for the principal or maintains a stock of merchandise from which he or she regularly fills orders on behalf of the principal and this person is not an independent agent. Again, good time to reiterate, why have we spent so much time defining trade or business income? Well, only trade or business income is taxed on a net basis to a foreign taxpayer or individual. Gross income minus effectively connected expenses equals net, net times graduated tax brackets. Any other type of income is FEDAP income, fixed, determinable, and periodic. It's subjected to a flat 30% rate and that 30% rate could be reduced by treaty to a lower rate and no expenses. Gross versus net, graduated brackets versus flat rate tax. And we're now going to start talking about the flat rate tax items. Generally with FEDAP we're talking about items that are not considered trade or business but they are from U.S. sources therefore the U.S. government has nexus to tax. Interest, dividends, rents, royalties, these are FEDAP type income items. Lastly, FEDAP type income items are paid for through withholding levied against the U.S. payor of the income to the offshore recipient of the income. The two code sections that govern this flat rate taxation are 871A and code section 881. Again, we're talking about essentially passive type income items here. Again, if you think FEDAP, think gross, no deductions. The flat tax found under code sections 881 and 871A are determined on a gross income basis and no deductions are permitted. Keep in mind, any expenses incurred in generating FEDAP do not produce a tax benefit. Sometimes it might be better to be considered a U.S. trader business and taxed on a net basis. For example, if you come into the United States and you borrow a bunch of money that you turn around and invest in U.S. based investments, this is considered investment interest and normally would be deductible to a U.S. taxpayer. But since you're generating a passive investment income, that's a passive investment expense and non-deductible. Where this can really hurt is where you come into the U.S. and you make passive investments in real estate. The mortgage interest, property taxes, maintenance expenses, property management fees, all of those type related expenses are non-deductible if this is considered a passive investment type activity. But if your investment activity in the United States in real estate rises to the level of a trade of business because your activities are sufficient, continuous, and regular, you'll get net taxation. Again, sometimes it may be better to go net than gross. It just depends. Another area where you may be impacted is where you're generating royalty income in the United States. The typical expenses related to royalty income, such as cost recovery methods, depreciation, amortization, are non-deductible in a passive royalty situation by a foreign taxpayer. What's important to realize here is that this 30% gross income tax may apply to income that the offshore taxpayer never actually received. For example, if you have a net lease in the United States where the U.S. taxpayer pays your interest and your property tax, nevertheless, you're still taxed on the gross amount of that rent. You don't get the deduction for the property taxes and the interest. Furthermore, even where you can very easily argue that an expense is associated with FEDAP income. For example, in rental real estate, the cost of maintaining the property is clearly associated with FEDAP. You don't get the benefit of it if you're dealing with a 30% gross tax. What you also need to realize is that the breadth 
of the classification of FEDAP income is very, very broad. Over time, a seemingly infinite variety of economic gains, regardless of being paid in a lump sum or being paid in periodic cash flows, whether from a one-off transaction or from a recurring set of transactions, whether from an indeterminate or generating a steady indeterminate or even erratic stream of cash flows, has been deemed by the IRS as FEDAP income. The breadth of FEDAP classification can be seen through the following example. The regulations show that the term fixed or determinal, annual or periodic, is merely descriptive of a general class of income under the regulations. If an item of income falls within the class of income contemplated in the statute and described in the above paragraphs, it is immaterial whether the payment of that item is made in a series of payments or in a single lump sum. Okay. FEDAP type income items received by foreign corporations but not technically effectively connected income with U.S. trade or business receive this same 30% gross taxing regime. Examples would be dividends, royalties, or other compensation that's similar to FEDAP type income. This is under code section 881 and this is on a gross basis at 30% unless modified by treaty. Mentioned earlier, the FEDAP tax is ordinarily paid through withholding by the payor. In other words, you're going to get 70% of the income that's due to you under FEDAP type income items and the other 30% is going to be remitted by the payer directly to the U.S. government and that will satisfy your tax liability on the FEDAP income. In its simplest form, the withholding requirements are a government requirement that the payor withhold 30% of each payment to you and remit it to the U.S. government to make sure that you pay taxes on your U.S. generated FEDAP income. The logic behind this is many foreign taxpayers don't have any U.S. assets that the government could go after if they didn't get paid. Therefore, they make the payor responsible for it. Matter of fact, they're personally responsible for it. If they don't pay it, the government can go after their assets for not paying it. To that end, under the U.S. tax code, any person, whether it be foreign or domestic, that has control, receipt, custody, disposes of any type of payment of any item of U.S. source income, they're deemed by law to be a withholding agent and personally responsible for withholding up to 30% of each payment so held and remitted. It is within the withholding agent's authority to grant a lower treaty-based withholding rate. If the, the tax you're subjected to under the treaty with your country is 10%, then they will only withhold 10% and remit 90% of each payment to you. So, how specifically are foreign corporations taxed on their U.S. income? Once a foreign corporation is deemed to be engaged in the U.S. trader business and has effectively connected income to that U.S. trader business, it's required under Code Section 1-6012-2G, subsection 1, to file an 1120F on an annual basis. Applicable foreign corporations are required to even file in years where they have no effectively connected income no U.S. source income, and even when the income that they do have is coming entirely from tax-exempt sources or where it's non-taxable under the Internal Revenue Code or via a treaty position. Regulations 1.6072-B require a foreign corporation to file its tax return within the 15th day of the third month following the close of its tax year. For calendar year foreign corporations, this means March 15th. In the United States, subchapter C corporations are subject to double taxation. They get taxed once at the corporate level, and once that net profit is distributed out to the shareholders, the dividends the shareholders receive are taxable once again at the individual level. To put foreign corporations on par with USC corporations, foreign corporations are subjected to what's called a branch profits tax. Under this branch profits tax regime, a foreign corporation, its income is subjected to tax once at the corporate level and raises up to 
and then once those profits are repatriated to the foreign parent, they are possibly subjected to a second level of tax called the branch profits tax at 30% unless modified by treaty rate. If the foreign corporation, rather than distributing its profits back to the foreign parent, invests those profits in additional U.S. assets, the branch profits tax is reduced by such investment. The idea behind this is if the profits are being invested in U.S. assets, they're not being repatriated back to the foreign parent. In addition to the branch profits tax, where a foreign corporation or a branch of a foreign corporation is paying interest expense back up to the foreign parent, that interest is subject to the 30% branch profits tax unless a lower treaty rate applies. Without this treatment, it may be possible for a foreign corporation to get around the branch profits tax by instead of making outright investments in U.S. assets to the branch, rather money is lent from the parent to the subsidiary and those borrowed funds are invested. This prevents the foreign parent from getting around the branch profits tax. So, how exactly is the branch profits tax determined? The first step in determining the branch profits tax is to determine the dividend equivalent amount. This amount is generally defined as the corporation's after-tax effectively connected income that is not reinvested in a U.S. business. If it's not re reinvested in a U.S. business, it's treated as though the funds were repatriated back to the foreign parent and therefore subjected to the branch profits tax. This dividend equivalent amount is then subjected to the 30% branch profits tax rate. To determine the net effectively connected income that has been repatriated to the parent, the following calculation is determined. The foreign corporation's net investment in the United States, or net equity, is analyzed at both the beginning of a tax year and at the end of the tax year. If the total investment or net equity went up, there's been no repatriation. If it went down, that is the deemed dividend amount or the repatriated investment. The U.S. assets for this purpose that are part of this net equity calculation are deemed to include all assets that could be considered effectively connected with the income generating business in the United States. The U.S. liabilities are all effectively connected liabilities. If the net equity in the United States increases between the beginning of the year and the end of the year, this increase in net equity is viewed as additional investment in U.S. assets and escapes the branch profits tax. The increase in equity is seen as an investment in the current year's effectively connected income and therefore escapes branch profits tax. If the net equity decreases between the beginning of the year and the end of the year, the net decrease is deemed to have been repatriated back to the foreign parent and is subjected to the branch profits tax. What's also important to realize here is simply shifting active business assets into passive investment type assets is enough to create a branch profits tax. So what are the purposes of tax treaties in general? The primary purpose of international tax treaties is to facilitate trade and investment by lowering tax barriers to the international flow of goods and services in and out of the United States. Secondarily, tax treaties are deemed to provide relief for double taxation. Example, where a foreign corporation is taxed both at home in its home jurisdiction and in the United States on the same income. A tax treaty can arrange it so that the income is only taxed in one jurisdiction versus two. Income tax treaties also provide coordination between the separate distinct taxing regimes of the two different countries. Many treaty provisions are designed to apportion or allocate out the tax ramifications of transactions that are known to impact both jurisdictions. To this end, many treaties try and establish clauses where income is only taxable to one jurisdiction and not to the other. Tax treaties also attempt to put in place a path for the smooth facilitation of business transactions and exchanges between treaty participant nations that might be thwarted by an overly aggressive tax regime of one or other of the treaty participants. 
Finally, tax treaties provide certainty and predictability such that taxpayers can arrange their affairs and conduct business with confidence so they understand the tax ramifications of their actions before they take them. Provisions of an income tax treaty have the same force as U.S. domestic law. Matter of fact, if a domestic law and a treaty provision are in conflict with one another, the last one to have been promulgated prevails. Commonly, tax treaties have the effect of reducing a taxpayer's U.S. tax liability, not increasing it. Where a foreign corporation is entitled to the benefit of a treaty provision, this may actually alter the way the U.S. statutory internal revenue framework may apply to a transaction. For example, the right of the United States to tax a foreign corporation under Code Section 882 can be modified via treaty provision. It can be modified such that they can tax only under 882 provided the foreign corporation maintains a permanent establishment in the United States and has income that is effectively connected to that permanent establishment. Moreover, a treaty provision can completely eliminate the 30% withholding requirement found under Code Section 881 in regards to U.S. source income, dividends, and other similar items, including interest. Foreign corporations wishing to do business in the United States must be made aware of the information filing requirements surrounding foreign corporations. There are a variety of U.S. information reporting requirements related to foreign corporations. For instance, a foreign corporation doing business in the United States may be required to file Forms 1099 or 1096 just like a domestic corporation would. A foreign corporation can be required to file Form 1042 in situations where it's making payments of U.S. source income to foreign persons. There are various reporting requirements applicable to U.S. shareholders, officers, and directors of foreign corporations and foreign personal holding companies where more than 10% of the stock is owned by U.S. persons. If more than 10% of the stock of a foreign corporation is owned by U.S. persons, several filing requirements are created. U.S. shareholders, officers, and directors of the foreign corporation and foreign personal holding companies with more than 10% of the stock owned by U.S. persons must comply with these filing requirements. Foreign corporations engaged in U.S. trader business are required to file Form 5472 to provide information about the corporation and transactions with any related parties during that tax year. The regulations under Code Section 6114 require disclosure any time a foreign taxpayer takes a treaty-based position on a U.S. return. A taxpayer can be considered to have adopted a return position under the regulations found under 301.6114-1A2I when the taxpayer determines its tax liability even if no return is actually filed. Essentially where the result is arrived at based on reliance on a treaty position. To determine if a treaty has changed the tax result, a taxpayer is required to basically prepare a return not including the treaty position and then do it again taking the treaty position. If the tax liability has been lowered via treaty position, there is a disclosure requirement. Code 7 6712 hits a foreign taxpayer with a $10,000 penalty for each, I mean each, failure to report a treaty-based return position. Under Regulation 301.6712A, the penalty is per transaction, not per annual filing. Can the U.S. government tax U.S. shareholders of foreign corporations? Unlike the general rule barring the U.S. government from taxing foreign corporations that aren't running U.S trader businesses or having effectively connected income to that U.S. trader business, solely having U.S. taxpayers associated with a foreign corporation creates nexus for the government to tax those shareholders. This nexus is defined in the Internal Revenue Code in the Controlled Foreign Corporation Regulations. These regulations are found in Subchapter F of the Internal Revenue Code. Subchapter F of the Internal Revenue Code specifically deals with U.S. taxations of foreign controlled corporations. 
More exactly, subchapter F dictates that certain types of income earned by a controlled form corporation, even where undistributed in a tax year, must be included in the gross income of the associated U.S. shareholders in the year the income is earned by the controlled form corporation, not necessarily when it's distributed to the shareholders. What is a controlled foreign corporation and why is this important? A foreign corporation will be defined as a controlled foreign corporation when U.S. shareholders own greater than 50%, at least 51%, of the value of the shares of that foreign corporation or the voting power of the foreign corporation. Only U.S. shareholders owning 10% or more of the foreign corporation are considered in this calculation of 50% shareholders. However, the definition of a U.S. shareholder for purposes of the Control Form Corporation rules is qualified. Only the U.S. citizens or resident aliens who own 10% or more of the shares of the Form Corporation count for purposes of this 50% test. The Internal Revenue Code, in determining whether it's looking at a controlled form corporation or not, looks to direct, indirect, as well as constructive ownership of shares in making this determination. Thus, it is possible to have multiple individual and corporate shareholders and still be considered a controlled form corporation if U.S. shareholders also have an interest in the corporate stockholder. It's also important to understand that U.S. partners in foreign partnerships can also face taxation. U.S. partners in foreign partnerships are taxed on their distributive share of income on an annual basis, regardless of whether they have actually received an annual distribution or not. To get around the branch profit tax rules, I often counsel foreign investors to form a domestic U.S. C corporation to do business within the United States. This domestic C corporation can be owned entirely by a foreign parent or by foreign shareholders. Additional filing requirements are necessary where a domestic corporation is owned by foreigners. For example, if 25% or more of a domestic corporation is owned by foreigners, a Form 5472 is required to be filed on an annual basis. Under U.S. domestic law, a corporation is deemed to be controlled by foreigners at any time where you've got 25% of the value of the stock or the voting power of the domestic corporation owned by foreigners or by a foreign corporation. Where a corporation is owned by foreigners, other requirements are required to be complied with under the law as well. A domestic corporation that is owned by foreigners is required to have a U.S person available in case any problem develops with the IRS, including audits or collection actions. Additionally, this corporation is required to have somebody authorized to accept service of process in case a lawsuit develops. Failure to comply with either of these requirements can result in penalties. What actions can foreign individuals or foreign entities take that can affect U.S. tax attributes on wholly offshore assets even before physical presence is achieved or nexus is achieved in the United States. In limited circumstances, the U.S. tax attributes of wholly offshore assets can be affected by the actions of foreign persons and foreign entities even when there's no immediate physical presence in the United States. Consider the following examples. The offshore sale of an asset by a foreign person or foreign entity will result in a step up in basis to fair market value of that asset to the offshore purchaser, even before any U.S. nexus attaches to any subsequent transaction involving that asset. Another example, property received by offshore inheritance receives a step up in basis to fair market value as of the date of death of the decedent, even where no U.S. estate taxes were levied against that inheritance. One thing a foreign national or foreign individual need, really needs to look out for when they decide to move or immigrate to the United States or invest in the United States is when they move in the United States or invest in the United States with appreciated assets, assets that are worth more than what you paid for them. 
that offshore appreciation gained between the time you bought the asset and before you moved in the United States is fully taxable within the United States if you sell that asset while the U.S. government has nexus over that asset. It's for this reason that I highly recommend that folks before they invest in the U.S. or before they immigrate to the U.S., they engage in pre-immigration tax planning, pre-immigration estate planning, of which my firm can help you with. Many recent immigrants to the United States have been hit by this tax trap. They don't realize that their offshore appreciation and their offshore assets is taxable upon a subsequent sale in the United States. This is because many offshore tax regimes allow for a step up to fair market value on assets when somebody immigrates into their country. And they assume since their country is willing to do it, the United States is as well. This is entirely incorrect. For this reason, U.S. tax advisors, including myself, are why is to be on the lookout for appreciated assets that a foreign entity or a foreign individual may wish to contribute in forming a U.S. corporation? The inherent gain in those assets will become subject to taxation in the U.S. even though that gain was earned entirely offshore and it can be avoided through proper tax planning. In the United States, the inherent gain in assets are excluded from gain upon contribution to a corporation or Code Section 351. This can actually work against an offshore investor's interests. The action of contributing an appreciated asset into a U.S. corporate entity will bring an, a gain that was earned entirely offshore into the U.S. tax system and is unwise. Where a U.S. corporation is utilized, this appreciated asset that's contributed to a C corporation could potentially face double taxation, once at the corporate level, once at the individual level when the profits are distributed as dividends upon a subsequent sale of an appreciated asset in the United States. This tax trap could be avoided in a multitude of ways. You can intentionally fail the requirements of 351 and recognize gain upon the contribution of the assets into the U.S. structure first, or the better way is to sell the assets offshore that are appreciated and only invest cash in the United States. That way the offshore appreciation is only recognized offshore and you've got basis of 100% in your cash when you invest in the United States C Corporation. Alternatively, appreciated assets can be transferred into a corporation in exchange for taking back debt in a manner that would cause you to fail Section 351 and you would have the recognition of gain upon transferring into the corporation. Not always the best way. The best way to do it is sell the assets offshore and only invest cash. Okay, that's it for this series. Thank you very much for watching this series and if you have any questions, I'm always happy to answer them. Thank you so much again for your time and interest in how we may be able to help you. Please don't hesitate to call if something is worrying you. We would be very happy to help. Just call or email for a reduced rate consultation.